We're going to start in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Today we're going to be talking about uh, Jesus' first recorded miracle. And this took place at a wedding in Cana. Uh, Why did Jesus use miracles? It's really kind of interesting because Jesus used those miracles to authenticate his claims to be the Messiah. And John the Arthur that wrote this book here, he called these supernatural acts that Jesus did signs. These were events that were attended to point people to, to God. It was a, to signal the presence of God amongst the people. Through the book of John, we'll see seven different signs and wonders. Today is the first one. And this morning, as we go through and we see Jesus is going to be attending a wedding, and this is where he's going to perform the first sign, the first miracle. Now, there's some things that we kind of need to know. I'm sure that you're very familiar with this, with Jesus going to the wedding and turning the water into wine. But just to give you a little bit of a background, a Jewish wedding of that day was much, much different than what we know of as a wedding today. Just to give you an example, today most people get married on Saturdays. And the reason why is because people come from out of town. Most people are off on Saturdays. It's a day that they could go through, and and it's most common for, for most people, the easiest day. But Jewish tradition, it required that virgins, a virgin to be married on a Wednesday. Widowers were to be married on Thursdays. Today's weddings normally last anywhere from an hour to six or eight hours, depending upon the wedding itself, and then the ceremony, and then the reception afterwards. But a Jewish traditional wedding lasted exactly one week, seven days. And it's kind of interesting because if you don't like weddings, if you're one of those people that don't like to be around a lot of people, A Jewish wedding would have been a difficult circumstance for you to be in. Because during that week, one whole week, seven full days, you had people come in from out of town. You had people that if you had ever met, oftentimes they would come. And if they didn't live in that same area, guess who they stayed with? They stayed at at the groom's home most of the time. During that time, whenever they came, they would stay. And guess what had to happen? They would take the bride, they would tuck her away, and nobody got to see her for those seven days. And then at the end of the seventh day, they would bring her out with all this fanfare and and pomp and velour. Everybody would cloud and cheer on, and then she would make her grand entrance into the room. Can you see how the weddings of that day are much, much different than what we know of as, as a wedding today? And so let's jump right in. John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana, Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does, that, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Well, when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, The master of the feast called the bridegroom. Verse 10, And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana, Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they they did not stay there many days. Just to kind of set this up, there in verse 1 when it says on the third day there was a wedding. This third day refers to the third day. Remember John the Baptist was standing there talking to some of his own disciples and he says, behold the Lamb of God. And when Jesus walked by, and at that time it says a couple 
of John the Baptist's disciples then started to follow Jesus. So now it's been about three days of Jesus' public ministry. Keep, keep in mind, up to this point, he has never performed a miracle. He's now been in the public ministry for three days. That's what they mean here, the third day. Now there's a wedding in Cana, and on this day, it says that the mother of Jesus was there. I think this is pretty important because notice it says it's the mother of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was not famous because he was the son of the Virgin Mary. We need to understand that. But she was well known because she was the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. The scriptures always give preeminent place to Christ over the mother. And you say, why are you making this a valid point? Because it's very important for us to know as Christians, evangelical Christians, Jesus is preeminent over anyone. You never go to the mother to get to the son. Okay? Okay? We always, we got, you and I have, if you're a born again believer, you have direct access to God right through Jesus Christ the Son. You never have to go to the mother to get to the Son. So it says here that they, the mother of Jesus was there in verse 2. It says, now both Jesus and his disciples were invited. Right now Jesus has about five or six disciples that are following him at this early in, inside of his ministry. Look at verse 3. It says, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. So here we see the supply of wine had failed. Now it's interesting because since a wedding lasted about a week in those days and times, what they normally did was they hired maybe like a master of the banquet. They would hire somebody that would oversee everything that was going on there in the wedding. And the reason they did this because it would be totally embarrassing to have a whole big group of people and you run out of wine or you run out of food, you run out of provisions. Oftentimes the family was so caught up with all the, every, the entertainment and everything that was going on, they would get distracted. So they would oftentimes hire somebody, and they called in the governor, the master of the banquet, however you would like to say it. He would oversee everything and make sure that everything was right on track. And that's exactly what they did in this particular situation. And then whenever Mary, real, oh, by the way, in those days and times, if, if you ran out of provisions, you could actually be fined. You could actually be fined. So here when Mary realized what had happened, she went to Jesus and she presented the problem to him. Now, she knew, think about this, Mary knew in her heart that Jesus could meet this need. Mary knew that Jesus could take care of this problem. He could provide wine. I believe that Mary, as I study this and study this and read of other articles on it, I really believe that Mary wanted Jesus at that particular time to show that he was the Messiah at that particular time. There it was. There was a need. And I believe that Mary knew that Jesus could reveal who he was to the guest as the Son of God. Remember, Mary knew from the very beginning that Jesus was a special, that he was special. Remember, an angel appeared to her and told her that she was going to have a son. You also remember that she conceived the son without having a, a relation with a man. So Mary knew that Jesus was God. She knew this all along. And I believe that now Jesus is starting to get him a couple of disciples following him. Now Jesus has been baptized. I believe that now it looked like things were starting to click a little bit. And I believe now that Mary was looking at her son and she was saying, Jesus, we're out of wine. For 30 years, I believe that Mary had been waiting for this to take place. For 30 years. Wondering when Jesus would make it known to the world. For 30 years, people had walked, walked around and they had whispered behind her back for 30 years. Because since she had Jesus, at that time, was she married? No. So she had an illegitimate son. Can you imagine what people in town had to say about that? 
So for 30 years, she'd probably been hearing all the whispers, all the negative little things said about her for giving, son, uh, giving birth to a son, and she wasn't married at that time. And as I said, now Jesus was at this point in the ministry where I believe Mary was wanting Jesus to come up and, and, and do this, perform a miracle. That way it would help exonerate her from all the rumors and all the bad things that had been said about her. How many of you would want that? I know I would. So I believe Mary had approached Jesus. But what did Jesus have to say to Mary in return when she said, we're out of wine? Look what he says there in verse 4. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. This is very, very important. That word woman, we need not to look at that in a negative context like maybe we would today. As a matter of fact, that word woman in that particular time showed respect. As a matter of fact, if you think about Jesus when he was on the cross, he said, woman, behold your son. So Jesus was not saying woman in a negative tone. It would be like him saying, ma'am. That's how we would say it today. Ma'am or lady, something along that line. But it was not in a negative uh, uh, tone that he was uh, saying that to her in. He was addressing her. And he said, and I really truly believe that Jesus loved his mother. Jesus was totally devoted to Mary. But here's the thing. Mary come to him with an earthly request. How many of us as humans would automatically say, yeah, mom, I'll take care of that and fill up the pots. But Jesus knew that for this time to take place, it had to come from the heavenly father and not from an earthly relationship. Does that make sense? That I believe that Jesus was waiting for that time to come for him to present who he is, but it needed to come from the Father in heaven and not from a natural earthly relationship. And Mary and some of his disciples, I'm sure at that time, they were waiting to see Jesus uh, reveal who he was. They wanted the Jesus to be glorified. But he had to remind them that my time has not yet come. Basically what he was saying there, it's just not that time yet, Mom. It's just not that time. Even though he knew that it was just a matter of time, but it was not at that particular moment. Look in verse 5. It says, His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Mary understood the meaning of the words that Jesus uh, had said to her, but she also knew what she was saying, that whatever he says to you, do it. Notice that she didn't direct people to obey her or any other human beings, to go to Mary to get to Jesus, as I said earlier, is totally alien from the Scriptures, from the Bible. I know we have a lot of people here from, from the background where you're taught differently. But nowhere in Scriptures does it tell us to go to Mary to get to Jesus, does it? So I think it's important. There are some people here that are new in the faith. You may not know this. By the way, those of you that maybe are Bible Scholars, Bible students, this is the last recorded words that you'll hear Mary say in the scriptures. These are the last words. So, therefore, I think it's very important that we understand what she's trying to say. Whatever Jesus says to you guys, that's what I, I want you to do it. So, I believe that since Mary, uh, these were the last words, I think it's, a, it's a good to pay attention to what she has to say. Because Mary was always trying to glorify Jesus and not herself. Isn't that important? Whatever he says, do it. How many of us know that that would be good advice for us, us to follow today? Whatever Jesus says, just do it. I think if we did that, maybe some of our lives may be a little bit differently, hadn't it? Let's look at verse 6. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Then in verse 8, it says, and he said to them, draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast, and then they took it. 
these six water pots or water jars. Said they held 20 to 30 gallons apiece. These were for purification. In other words, when they came, they got ready to eat or they get ready to go into the temple to worship, they would try to purify themselves of anything that maybe they had come into contact with that wasn't clean. This could be a dead corpse. This could be a dead animal. This could be anything that's associated with not being pure and holy. How about everyday life? Oftentimes, I read an article where it said that oftentimes when a, when a woman went through that time of the month, that they would take these big barrels and she would actually climb down in the barrel and climb down in it and come back up as a, as a purification process. So when they got ready to go inside the temple or whenever they got ready to eat, there said all these big pots. So they would take these big pots, then they would pour it over their hands and they would wash themselves just to get rid of any influences from the world that may have contacted them. So look what Jesus told these guys. He said, hey guys, there are six water pots. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go fill them up. And notice what they did. They did it, didn't they? Here's the thing. I believe that the Lord was showing, showing me through this. He wanted to cut the cooperation of these servants in this miracle. He wanted them to have part of it. Because Jesus could have done like that and had it filled without these guys touching it. Do you agree? But oftentimes Jesus wants you and I, listen to this, oftentimes Jesus wants you and I to be part of it. Part of what he's doing to be part of the blessing. And as I was studying this, I kept thinking, maybe God's trying to say to us, I want you part of my work. I want you part of my ministry. I want you part of my church. I want you doing things because when you're just sitting on the sidelines, oftentimes you're not really the one to receive the blessings. The people that normally receive the blessings are the people that are involved in doing the work of the Lord. Do you agree with that? It's, it's amazing because I hear some people come into church and they, they walk out and they come and they taught Sunday school, they sing in the choir, they did whatever is part of the church here. And then they come in, they hear the word, and they leave and they say, I was blessed. And then sometimes I hear people say, well, I didn't get anything out of church today. Did you ever think that maybe you didn't put anything into it to get something out of it? you got to be part of the blessing to receive the blessing. Amen? And Jesus was telling these guys right here, I want you to take those water pots, I want you to fill them up, then I want you to take, pour it out into a cup, then I want you to take it to the master of ceremonies. I believe the King James translation says governor. Is somebody reading the King James? But I believe it calls it governor. And, but anyway, so it says that they did that. Think about this. They did that. Did that take some faith for those guys to do that? Think about it. What if Jesus told you, go fill those pots up, take a cup, dip down in it, and take it over there to, to the master of ceremonies? What would you think? What would you have said to Jesus? Why am I going to do that? They need wine. They don't need a cup of water. What do you think was in their minds when they handed the cup to the master of ceremonies? You think they thought maybe in their mind he was going to take a drink, spit out, and say, why didn't you bring me water? Think about this. That took faith amongst the disciples to do this. But yet in faith, they obeyed. That's the key thing I want us to get across. In faith, they did it. But look at verse 9. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants had drawn the water new, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And look in verse 10. <clears throat> and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. The usual practice at a wedding back in those days was to, first of all, bring out the best wine while people still had their senses, <laughs> while people still had their taste buds. And then later on, after eating a bunch and after drinking a bunch, their taste buds kind of went down. But he says, no, but you've taken and you've saved the good wine until now. 
Here's something I got out of this. The world offers you the best first. Hey, get high. Get drunk. Watch this. And it shows your excitement right off the bat. But the Lord starts out and He shows you good, but it does what? It just gets better and better and better. When you walk with the Lord, the longer you walk, the better that it gets. But when you walk with the world, it may start out fun at the beginning. But as time goes on and you get hooked on whatever it is that that, that you're being teased with, it gets worse and worse and worse, and you find yourself at the bottom of the barrel. But yet with Christ, it just gets better and better and better. As we walk with Him, we see His glory come upon us. He reveals to us His majesty, and things just get better and better. Oh, that doesn't mean we're going to have all high times. There's going to be a lot of low spots. But the longer we walk with the Lord, the more we put our trust in Him, the more that we obey Him, the more that we see His faithfulness, that He loves you. So here, it's kind of interesting because it says that you say the good wine until now. Can you imagine how that made the groom feel? Yeah. I mean, imagine you being the groom and putting on this big party, and all of a sudden you run out of supplies. It's not like you can go down to the 7-Eleven or the ABC liquor store. That's not the way it was in that day, was it? So for you to run out with something major, now all of a sudden you run out and it's replaced with something even better? I can imagine the groom was excited at that particular point. Now, here's something I want us to, to really understand. When he says good wine, it doesn't particularly mean that it had a high alcohol content. And I'm going to get into this just for a second because this verse right here is commonly mistaught. And it's commonly misheard. So I just want to go over this for a few minutes. It doesn't mean that it's high in content, but what it does mean, it was well made. It was good wine. Some people go to great lengths to, to show that Jesus, the wine that he made was really grape juice. That's not what it says here, folks. It says you made good wine, and guess what? Good wine is good wine. Good wine is not just good grape juice. Good wine is good wine. Keep in mind, in that particular day and time, wine was a part of your daily diet. Wine was a part of it. Wine in the Bible represents joy. With people in that day, the water was not that pure. There's all types of problems with water. What they would do is they would take, oftentimes, and, and I've read up quite a bit on this, they would actually take, and say if they had a glass, they uh, uh, say a glass, they would take and put one-third wine in it, then dilute it with two-thirds water. So it would not be as strong because they would drink wine all throughout the day and the evening. It just had a much lower alcohol content than what our wine does today. But it was still wine. Now, (coughs) saying that, some people use this story as a justification for them to drink wine. They say, Jesus made wine. Jesus drank wine. So don't talk to me, Bill, about drinking a little wine. Well, if you're using this as your argument based upon Jesus, and you're following him, you'll never drink again. Flip back to Luke. Hold your place right there. But flip back a little bit to Luke chapter 18. For people that base their argument, and I'm not here to tell you whether you can drink wine or whether you can't drink wine. That's between you and the Lord. I don't approve it, but I'm not telling you you can't do it either. But if you're using this as an argument that Jesus made wine, Jesus drank a little wine, so it's okay for you to drink wine, look at Luke chapter 22, verse 14. (coughs) It says, when the hour had come, talking about the Lord's Supper, When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 17. 
and 18. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Look at verse 18. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So is Jesus having wine right now? I don't believe so. So if you're basing your right to drink wine, Jesus says he's not going to drink wine again until the kingdom of God to the age comes. You know, as being a worker in the church, I've seen some of the damage that alcohol can do. And as I said, I'm not here to tell you that you can drink or you can't drink. That's between you and the Lord. But as a worker in the church, I've seen the damage that it can do to a marriage. I've seen the damage that alcohol can do to a family, our society as a whole. I know talking to the chief of police of the, of the department there where I live, I asked him, I said, what are your biggest calls that you get being the police department? He said, weekends, our number one call is people get drunk and beat up their spouses. That's our number one call on Friday night and Saturday night. Me being from the family of alcoholism where Seven boys in my dad's family died of alcoholism, cirrhosis of the liver, before they were 55 years old. I know what alcohol does. You know, and like I said, uh, that's between you and the Lord, how you deal with it. But I don't promote it. But if you want to have a glass of wine and you say between you and the Lord that's okay, then, then that's between you and the Lord. But I know for me personally, I've just seen too many consequences of alcohol and what it can do to the family. Enough said? Three. Okay, look at verse 11. It says, The beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. So here we see in verses 11 and 12, this was the first of the miracles, the first of the signs. There are some groups that teach that, that teach that Jesus had performed miracles as a boy. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that. Okay? And it says the result of Jesus performing these miracles, it says that Christ's glory was revealed. He showed who he was. Just what we said, the reason for these miracles was to show that he was who he claimed to be. The Son of God. And it says that when he did this, it revealed his glory, who he was. That he was the Son of God. And as a result of it, here's the part where I think it plays with you and I. The more that we walk with the Lord, and the more that we obey the Lord, the more that we will see the Lord do things in our lives. Some people say, do you really believe in miracles? I'm going to tell you, from a position in the church, I see miracles all the time. I look at each one of you, and a lot of you are miracles. To even be sitting in church. I'm a miracle to even be sitting up here talking this morning. That is a miracle, amen? When something happens in our lives and we don't handle things the way that we have always handled them, in the past we start handling things a godly way, that's a miracle, folks. That's a miracle. So here, we see that it says that their disciples, their faith was strengthened. It was grounded even more because they watched Jesus do this sign. Here's the neat part. As we go through the book of John, we're going to see these disciples witness miracle after miracle after miracle by hanging out with him. You and I are so blessed to have this word of God as our manual for life. That as we sit here and we read and we see how Jesus handles different situations in life, you know what you and I are supposed to be doing? Learning from it. So that as we see how he handles issues and you and I study his word together and we learn that and we take and apply it to our life, when those daily issues come to us in life and we handle it things God's way, We'll see miracles take place. Too many times, though, we want to do things our own way and still expect the blessing of God to be on it. It doesn't work that way, folks. 
when we usually get blessed is when we're walking with the Holy Spirit. When we're walking in the light of the Lord. I believe that God was showing us just a couple of things here. One of them is those of you that want to serve the Lord to a much greater degree, and those that are just starting out and say, hey, I'm kind of new to the faith. I'd like to start following the Lord. I'd like to see more miracles in my life. I'm going to tell you something. The day I quit smoking was a miracle. The day I quit doing drugs was a miracle. The day I quit drinking alcohol was a miracle. Miracles still happen today. But you have to be obedient to the Lord oftentimes to see those many things. I believe that Jesus, here's one of the things. One of the things that God shows us in these verses here. Jesus gave these guys directions that they were to do. He didn't give them the results ahead of time. Did he? He told these guys what to do one step at a time. He says, here's what I want you to do. First of all, I want you to go fill the pots. When they had done that, the second thing he said to them, now I want you to take, draw some water out. Step two, they did it. Step three, he says, now I want you to take a cup of that and take it to the master of the banquet. Step three. They did all three steps that he told them to do. And then the miracle occurred, but only as they done what the Lord had instructed them to do. You and I, as a, oftentimes, we want step two through five before we do step one, don't we? Amen? Don't we? Look at the person next to you and say, I know you really do. Is that right? Can anybody relate where I'm coming from? Yeah. Usually I want to know, hey, where am I going to be next week? Where am I going to be next month? Where am I going to be next year? Where am I going to be three years from now? Lord, clearly lay out this path for me, then I'll follow it. Isn't that what we want from the Lord? But guess what? I hate to say this. The Lord doesn't work that way. It's called faith. You have to step out in faith. He unfolds his plan for us the same way that he did for these disciples, one step at a time. And then the point when you and I get where we stop obeying, guess what? That's the point where the miracle starts, uh, stops happening. So as long as you and I stay faithful, the Lord will continue. And so I believe the first thing is, 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 is in order for you to follow the Lord and see that miracle, the first thing I believe that we need to do is to be obedient to what he tells us to do. One of the issues is, is we have a tendency to pick up the Bible and where it gives us clear direction about certain things, we have a tendency to come up with our own excuses why we're not doing it. Well, Lord, it's not really that way today. Things were a lot different back then. Lord, it's okay to do this today. Times are a little different right now. Then next thing you know, we start creating our own God. I know that's harsh, but oftentimes when we read the scriptures and we don't want to obey it, we start creating our own God to be the way that we want him to be. And if you and I are to connect with God and see his miracles, we have to connect with the God of the Bible, the God of the Scriptures. We have to do as he tells us to. So I believe the first thing that we need to do is be obedient. And here's the second thing. As you're being obedient, you have to be patient. This is the hard part for all of us. Patience is the hardest thing in the life of a Christian, I believe, that there is to do. Because we live in an instant world where everything is right now. If you don't know something, Google it. If you don't know something... Ask somebody. Whatever it is, you go right to it. I know last night I was looking for a particular scripture verse. Instead of sitting down with the Bible and opening it up, I Googled it. I'm not lying to you. <laughs> but we live in that type of a world today. And Now think about this. Jesus had made the comment to his wife, Woman, my hour has not yet come. I'm talking about patience here. Jesus knew better than anyone how Mary, his mother, had been waiting patiently. Thirty years she had been waiting. Thirty years she had people bad-mouthing her. Thirty years she had people whispering behind her back. Thirty years she had been called names, I'm sure. And Jesus says, hey, Mom, I know. I know better than anyone what you've been going through. And Jesus knew how his mother had been hurt by all these different things. His mother having a child out of wedlock. But listen to this. He says, Mom, I know your situation, but my time hasn't come yet. 
What does that say to you and I? Think about this. I hear this oftentimes here in the church. I hear people say, you know what, Bill? I've been serving the Lord for many, many years. But I'm not seeing the Lord work in my life in certain areas. And I hear this so common. We're just driving here this morning, we get a phone call from a friend. And, and Jesus, I mean, uh, Judith was ministering to her on the phone about Jesus. Have faith. Have faith. You can't just get negative about your situation because things are not going right. Have faith. And Judith just kept ministering to her the whole time as I'm driving down the road and I'm listening. I'm, I'm thinking about all this. And you say, well, I've been walking with the Lord for years. Nothing's happening. My circumstances are not getting better. As a matter of fact, Bill, I think my circumstances may even be getting worse. And Jesus says, you know what? I know what you're going through. Maybe my hour has not come yet for you. But it will. You know, I know that I talk to a lot of single people, and they say, you know what, I've been waiting to have a mate in my life, and the Lord just doesn't seem to be sending somebody my way. And I'll say to them, you know what, the Lord has a mate for you. But what he's doing, maybe he's trying to get the other person prepared to come into your life. Maybe that person has an alcohol or drug, or maybe they're abusive physically. And maybe the Lord's working all that situation out of their life before he brings them into your life. But if you jump ahead of the plan, you may get a, a wife beater. You may get an alcoholic. You may get a drug addict. Stay in the plan with God. I just spoke with the fellow yesterday, and he says, you know what, my job, I'm, on, I'm at the end of it. And I just kept thinking in my mind, just, I know there's people here in this church who are going through the same challenges. Here's what I pray. And I believe the Lord would say to you this morning, those of you that are going through challenges in your jobs, don't quit. Don't quit your job. I'm arranging for that guy to get transferred to another area so he don't have to oversee you. Pray for that guy to get a transfer of that woman to another area. Or maybe pray to get your heart changed. Oftentimes, God puts people over us oftentimes to teach us something, but sometimes we come to a point where I've learned enough. Amen? But be praying that if you're in that situation, don't quit, don't give up. Just allow the Lord to transfer that person to another area. Somebody's finances might be bad. And Jesus says to you, my time's not come yet, but have I ever let you down yet? I've provided every need that you've had so far, and I met that need. Another person may be health. You know, and I keep thinking about, about Rena and some of the other folks in here that are going through some bad health problems. You know what? The Lord's saying, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. My, your time is coming. My time has not yet come, but it will come. Your marriage is going to get better, some people. But the Lord says, first of all, I've got to minister to the hearts of those people that are involved in it. God says... Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, just like with the disciples. Do what I ask you to do one step at a time. Trust me, just as those disciples trust me when they got the water. Be part of the blessing, and you'll be blessed by having your faith strengthened. But most of all, what the Lord would say to you today, and I truly believe this with all my heart, is the Lord just says, I want you to spend time with me. Spend time with me and love me. And the Lord would do the same for you. And then when you do that, I truly believe, suddenly, the Lord's time will come in your life. You know, I just want to encourage you today. I bought this book years ago when I was going through a seminary. And as a matter of fact, I bought it not knowing that the lady that taught the class that wrote this book was going to come in and teach my seminary class. And it's called All the Suddenlies of the Bible. People that were down and out on their last stroke, ready to give up, suddenly the Lord came in their life and changed the whole entire situation. Why am I saying this? I want to encourage you, get books. Read the Bible on things that you're going through. Get books 
that people have wrote that may be going through something similar to what you're going through, and, and read them. And, and stand and get rid of that stinking newspaper that you read every day, all day. You'll know more about all the news in the world, but I want you to know more about how God can change your life suddenly. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father.